All right. Uh, Cassidy Shield is here with me on the show. Um, Cassidy Shield is the VP of Marketing at Narrative Science. Um, Cassidy's background, so lots of great companies, VP of Marketing at GoGo, VP of Marketing at Netcracker, and a whopping 13 years at Alcatel Lucent, which was purchased by Nokia. Also, we've got a connection. I got to call this out that we both went to Kellogg. So there's nice. that. <laughs> um, and so uh, narrative science, let's talk about narrative science a little bit. It was founded in 2010, 88 people and based out of Chicago, Illinois, and has raised Series D funding $43.4 million total. Um, let me give a little bit of a quick blurb uh, and you let me know if I missed anything, but basically narrative science humanizes analytics with data storytelling, not dashboards. So uh, when I was looking at your website, it's right there, right there, easy to see, like no more dashboards. Clearly that's the villain in your story. This is correct. And narrative science has has created a way to humanize analytics. So um, did I get that right? What did I miss? Like, I'd love to hear, like, who's yeah. who's this for? What, what, what problem are you solving? Maybe get a little bit. Let's start there and get a little more deep. Yeah, yeah. I think you did a great job of summarizing that, Anna. And it's a pleasure being here. And I didn't know we had the catalog connection, so I like you already. Um, so... You know, we're a company that was founded 10 years ago on kind of this mission to make data understandable for everyone. And throughout the years, we've done that in a variety of different ways. But the latest incarnation of that is, is our product, Lexio. And, you know, the, the problem we're tackling in the market is we all know we need data to drive our decisions for our business. We also know we have access to a lot of data, like that part of uh, the data and analytics ecosystem is on fire with things like Snowflake and Amazon and Microsoft, et cetera. But the way we consume this data today as, as individuals on the business and a marketing team on the business side are dashboards and spreadsheets. This is the same way we've been doing it for 20 years. And that way is antiquated and doesn't work for many of us. And so what we are doing is building a better way, a, a way that's more akin to like how we consume information today in our personal lives. We want to bring that to the business world. And um, the technology we've pioneered to make that possible is we turn data into language or stories automatically. So you might be looking at numbers and we'll turn those into words and stories and describe to you what's going on in your business. And that's how we do it. Can, can you give me an example? Because I want like the listeners to really grasp what does it mean when you're looking at a dashboard or you're looking at data or you're looking at a spreadsheet and you're looking at numbers and in your head, right? Like in my head, I try to create a story from the numbers I'm seeing. Can, like what does narrative science or what does this tool help you do? Yeah, you said it very well there. And it's when all of us look at a dashboard or look at a spreadsheet we're asking ourselves the story. And that story is usually, what is this telling me? How's it compared to what I expected it to, what I expect my business to be doing? What do I need to know? And what should I do with this information? And each one of those questions that you're asking yourself is in the context of you personally. Like that's why you're looking at this. You don't really care about, you know, you may be interested in other parts of the business, but what you want to know is what's it mean to me? And so what, we've developed with our latest product is um, think of it as an analyst on your shoulder, which is telling you, Anna, exactly what you need to know. So how are you tracking versus your metrics, your goals, the, the goals that you specifically care about for your function? What is it that's happening in the data that you need to know about? So what's changed that you need to delve into and be aware of and take action on? And that allows you to do that. It does that It does that in the context of you in a very simple way. So it comes to you. You don't have to go to it. So it'll alert you. It'll notify you and say, here's what's happening in your business today. So think of that as a daily briefing. And here's what we suggest you need to do about it. And so you can collaborate in the tool. You can share that information, um, so forth and so on. But we've really tried to create this notion of a modern experience where 
Um, think about what we do in our personal lives. We go on Twitter, we go on Apple News, we go on LinkedIn. We feel like your business data and your business story should be the same way. And you should consume those in the same an equivalent experience. So one of our sales team members like to say, we're taking your Saturday and Sunday technology and bring it into Monday through Friday. And so that's what we aim to do with Lexio. And so far the reception to this has been amazing because um, you know, the vast majority of us out there do struggle with looking at dashboards and spreadsheets that aren't really contextualized to like what we need to know about our business and our daily function. And that's the problem we're trying to solve. Cool. And um let's talk about like who's your biggest audience uh group like I, I think that this could work across many different teams across different companies but who's really the the, the type of like persona or ideal customer that you're looking yeah. for i think this will set up um an interesting conversation on kind of marketing in general and that is let's talk about it from like a, a demographic perspective and it, it tends to be either an anal analytics function or it tends to be uh, a business function. So think of that as CMO, head of sales, CLO. What we found because of what we do is it has to be top down for the most part, because this is a disruptive technology. We're saying, listen, the thing that you've bought and spent money on and have had in place in your company for 20 years needs to change. And, you know, so we're squarely in disruptive technology, early adopters. You need to have visionary leaders who are going to make that decision and take that chance. And, and this is textbook. You can read this in Crossing the Chasm as an example. We've seen it play out in our market. So we'll get a lot of analysts and managers really interested in the technology, believing that it solves a problem. But we know right away if they don't have senior level sponsorship who is also innovative, the project's not going to get done. So from a marketing perspective, demographically, it sits in two different camps. We're either going to be, it's either going to be led by the business or led by the analytics team at a director or senior level of which eventually we need to form in our sales strategy, a partnership between those two to get a deal done. Now that's all well and good. The bit that's hard for marketing and hard for us is the psychographic profile that we need to find the notion of your, that this person is an early adopter. We don't go on LinkedIn. There's nothing in our profile that says, you know, check Anna's an early adopter. So, you know, bring disruptive technology to me. And so that's the thing that's been difficult um, and kind of an interesting challenge for us is like, how do we, how do we find those people or how do we enable in our marketing, those people to find us, which is usually how it happens. How are you trying to solve that cha challenge? Because I, I get it. Like this is part of your really good, nice persona development, that three-dimensional person that helps you get to those target buyers faster. Yeah. So it's the things that we do. Uh, you mentioned you go to our website and you see no more dashboards. And so like our campaign and kind of our message in the market is unapologetic about challenging the status quo. We do that because obviously that's what we believe, but we do that because um, what happens is early adopters need to find you. And so what we're trying to hit on is a massive pain that they're fed up with that they want to do something about. And so, you know, we have to have a villain and we have to go after it and we have to be uncomfortable about that and the conversations that arise from it. And so that was like, that's one of the big switches we made in kind of us as a company and in marketing, I would say in the last nine months is going after that. And it's worked immensely well. And it's worked really well at um, drawing out the people who are visionary. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, what about your marketing team? Is there anything unique, would you say, in the way that you're structured now? You're, you're 88 people, which is actually for a Series D funded startup um not so many i would say right it's it's pretty um it's still fairly lean um given that like started in 2010 so how are you lean on the marketing team as well or um how, well, how are you structured? i think we're i think we're in a good good shape um the series d it's interesting when you build technology that's 
never been built before. What you have, what happens in your, you know, your journey as a startup is you go through a variety of pivots. And so like we've, like, this is a third generation of product that we've had. The other two are still in market. They do well, you know, but part of the reason we have 88 people and not, you know, 488 people is because of those, you know, zigzag journey of us as a company on the marketing side. Um, we're in good shape. We have two main teams. It's nothing, this is not unique. We have a team we call growth, which is demand gen and brand together. And we have a team on that's product marketing and there's a few people in each. I think what is unique about the team is, um, almost no one in the position they're in today has ever done the function before. So my pro the two people I have in product marketing, uh, weren't product marketers, the woman that has, that runs growth. Uh, had never run growth. Um, one of our product marketers spends half of her time doing design work for us because that's something she's passionate about and she's never been formally trained in design. Um, and so that to me is unique because if you read anything you read on LinkedIn from the marketing experts out there would say, you shouldn't do that, but you need to hire people with X amount of experience. That experience needs to come from startup land SaaS backgrounds. And that's the only way you'd be successful. And I would say this has worked very well for us because we have a tremendously talented people who are great at problem solving and handling adversity and uncertainty um, and have a lot of grit and curiosity and kind of a, you know, I call it a um, high bar. And that's kind of what we do when we hire people in our company. And that's how we build our marketing team. So um, I think that bucks kind of you know, the standard kind of, um, you know, recommendations that people make in, you know, in the market when it comes to building marketing teams. Oh, absolutely. This definitely goes against like, who, who are you, who do you hire for this role? Well, you're going to look for someone that comes from startups and has done it before. Well, it doesn't sound like it from your nope. perspective. Nope. Not <laughs> so at all. You, you mentioned a lot of like personality traits. Do you, in your interview process, do you use that like to look for, okay, is this a person that sets a high bar? Is this a person that's curious? Like that seems to matter more than the training is there. Yeah, we, we hire extensively on the behavioral side and we have certain traits that we're looking for and certain ways to inter interview for that. And that's just not marketing, that's across the company. So it'll take us time to find somebody who fits um, our culture and kind of the behaviors we're looking for, but that... Um, that's, that is the reason you don't get a job at narrative science and never has anything to do with like your technical capabilities. It's also the reason you can get a job here despite not having necessarily the technical background. Fascinating. So, yeah. Very big on cultural fit. And that's something that the company, it's not like the company has always been that way. It's, you know, over 10 years you evolve and, you know, if you go back, you talk to our CEO and you go back to the beginning, they hired people who had the best pedigrees and had, you know, best schooling and were PhDs and looked good on paper. And what resulted was a, a terrible culture. And, and so over time, I got to give them credit. They've, they've pivoted the way they've hired. And that's the reason I ended up here. I was not a SaaS marketer um, when I joined the company. Um, and I'm grateful for that. And, and I look at the team that we built, I'd put this marketing team up against any marketing team out there as far as capabilities go. And so um, I think we're onto something when it comes to bringing in talent. So for, you, for your growth team and your product marketing, like the demand gen person or people, that did they have demand gen in their background or did they bring them on and they kind of like figured stuff out quickly? Yeah, so um, we have one woman in, in our, you know, the woman who runs demand gen for us, she had some background in this, but when I joined the team, she was kind of your classic jack of all trades marketer who could do everything, which isn't really healthy from a career development perspective. So we've gotten her kind of into the right role, which is, which is part of this. It's hiring the right people, but it's also getting them into the right role and giving them the correct responsibilities to leverage their capability. So she has some of that experience, but one of the things I'm here to do is understand what our gaps are. And so we brought in somebody to help us, um, I say a year and a half ago on some of the demand gen side, who's been a great, they've been a great partner for us um, to kind of help augment the things that we don't know. 
the things that we weren't as familiar with is like tactically day to day, the buttons we need to push when it comes to paid media. I'd rather have my team very, very focused on message, creative audience, have somebody who can help us and run the machine underneath. And that's what we partner for and we bring in both in terms of demand gen, but also in terms of like web development and so forth. But what I, what we're not going to outsource is message is creative, um, is knowing our product and our value proposition and our audience. Those are the things that demand that the team needs to be experts in. Wonderful. Thank you so much and for sharing this. And I wanted to, to go a little deeper on the question because I find this fascinating. I don't come across this a lot. So I love that you you um, shared that with me. So the podcast. Yeah. It's it's not just me. It sounds like you're a podcast host too. Um, Leading with Data is the name of the podcast. And I want to ask you, like, what are you trying to do with it? What's the purpose? How's it going? Are you drowning? It's a lot of work. <laughs> it, it is. It is. So this was... Um, this is an idea that we'd had in our head since I've been here, but we weren't taking it serious until COVID happened. And then when COVID happened, we, like everybody, threw out our marketing playbook and we said, what are we going to do that's different? And we said, let's start the podcast. The reason I'm a host is because my team said, listen, you're going to be the host uh, because you're the head of marketing and we need somebody senior to do it. So whether you like it or not, this is your job. And so I've learned to love it over time. Um, we do it for a few reasons. One is um, we want to give back to the community. So over 10 years, we've built like a, a great, a really good following. And we're big into building up, you know, continuing to build that following from a community perspective. And the community has a common trait. They're all people who want to drive change with data. And so what we wanted to do with the podcast is interview other people who've been driving change with data, not just senior people, but people on the front lines and share what, their learnings and experience with the rest of our community. So that's kind of, that's one. Two, um, this allows us to have conversations and meet people outside of the selling process, which we find valuable, right? So it's not just getting back to the community, but I get to go off and talk to really interesting people and um, learn from them myself. And that helps our company. And that helps build relationships with people who may be customers of ours in the future or may be willing to recommend others to us. And so from a networking perspective, uh, it's just a prudent thing to do. And I think I, and part of that, what I mentioned is the third aspect is, um, you know, we're trying to pioneer something new in the space of data and analytics. That doesn't mean we're experts in data and analytics. So every time I interview somebody who is an expert in this space, we learn something as a company. Product management learns something, sales learns something, marketing learns something, I learn something. Um, so it's, you know, valuable insight for us in order for us to kind of form our strategy and our direction going forward as well as an organization. So it's been great. Um, I've learned to love it. People enjoy it. Folks, as you know, go, who go on the podcast to talk about their experience, enjoy it. So I don't actually see the downside. Um, to your point, it is more work than most people would imagine from the outside. Um, and so we do have some help on that. And my, you know, my team is really good at doing it, but it is a commitment. It's not one of those things you get for free. Um, it's a decision you need to make as an organization because it, it's going to take time and resources. Sounds like somebody made the decision to make you the host. So yes. <laughs> glad you went <laughs> along with it. Um, do you, you didn't mention as, as like using the podcast as part of your content. Do you, I imagine you do though, right? Like that, the, the information you get there, the video, Absolutely. do you make videos? Do you share that? Do you place your audio yeah. out? Okay. Yeah, we do. We so we subscribe to this. I think this is a toy that sweet the term is sweet fish media coin, like content based networking. If you ever heard of sweet fish media, yes. Um, and we 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 think it's a it's a great way to think about it. Like we obviously use content from our community um, as part of our content strategy to build the network. Um, so we do the podcast. We've We've done other tactics, like we've a woman on my team went off and she interviewed 20 thought leaders in data and analytics and wrote up like 20 best practices from 20 leaders and shared that back out. And when we share out content like that, we don't gate it. We just share it back out to the community. Um, you're talking about what other innovative ideas. We did, uh, you know, 60 data change makers. So we had people um, 
nominate other people that they thought were data change makers. And then we celebrated those 60 people and put that back out there. So um, yeah, this is the big emphasis for us is using content, other people's content from the community um, and kind of promoting that to others in the community. And, you know, and, and that's just being the conduit to doing that. Love that. Love that. Okay. So you clearly have 20 plus years of experience, like lots of experience, lots of learnings, still learning because as a marketer, you never stop. Right. Um, and I found this quote uh, where you say the key to, to digital is great content that leads the buyer to what you sell. Can you explain this a little bit more? Like, what does that mean? The key to digital is great content that leads the buyer to what you sell. Um, so first of all, you're very kind. Um, Cause another way of saying you have 20 years of experience is that you're just old. <laughs> so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> you're, you're very wise. Yeah. I'm very wise. I <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's funny. You put that, you shared that quote with me and I was like, did I say that? Um, no, I think, I think digital is amazing in that the only thing that's inhibiting a marketing team is their imagination and creativity. And so what I, what I mean by leading using content to lead the buyer to what you sell, it's, we all know this buyers don't want to hear about uh, you or your product. They want to be entertained. They want to be educated. They want to be inspired. They want to be moved. And so digital allows us to do that in a variety of different formats um, at scale and quickly test. And I think being able to embrace that is fundamentally changed marketing I, from my perspective, from where I was, you know, 20 years ago, where you didn't have this capability digitally and a lot of your marketing was in person. Um, or you'd throw up a big ebook and gate it and wait. I mean, these things like, yes, we still run some of those playbooks, but what digital has allowed us to do is really build relationships that scale. And if you do, and you, you have to believe if you do that well, people are going to engage with you. They're going to want to understand who you are as a company and what you do. And eventually they'll seek out, okay, well, now I understand what narrative science does. And if I ever need that because of the relationship we've established by giving, you know, most people know how to take it from there when it comes to like um, what you sell and when they're ready to buy. So, you know, it's hard to do, it's hard to keep that in mind all the time, but um, I think that's what digital affords us that uh, marketing in the past, you know, back when I started um, didn't allow us to do. And so it's one of the reasons I think it's a fascinating role. Yeah, and this never it never gets old to talk about this because I think that the not all companies really get that. They really get that that's what digital is about. It's not how the thinking from 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, even 5 years ago. Yeah. It's very different the way you build relationships. Like that's the point. That's the point of marketing. Like how do you build that relationship? That's why when I go on LinkedIn, and I connect with someone and they pitch me their service or product, I do not respond. Yeah. And I really? do not respond well to that. <laughs> but you're right, it's it's a lot easier to, I think, um, for, for folks to like, okay, now I'm ready to sell. Like, that makes sense. I know my product, I know what I, it can do for you, I'm ready to sell. But it's the stuff that's like, how do you build the relationship? That's harder for a lot, a lot of companies, a lot of people. Yeah, and, I, and I'll give one trade-off I think is fascinating because we've debated, we've debated this since I've been here. Most people know the debate since COVID of, oh, well, take the take your event money because you're not going to events and reapply it to digital. And I think a lot of marketers have seen um, the opportunity there. But I'll take another one. We don't have a PR agency. And this company historically had been built on PR. And... It's hard to justify that these days. So I'm going to spend 15 to 20 grand a month minimum for a tier one PR firm. Or I take 15 to 20 grand a month and plow that into digital. And no matter how you want to measure that, you can measure it by reach. You can measure it by conversion. You can measure it by revenue. Uh, every single time the digital channel is going to outperform traditional PR. And so that's not to say there won't be a point in time in your company when you need traditional PR, 
But when you take that, you kind of compare like the old world of doing this to the new world. Um, the new world's going to win nine times out of 10. Do you think that the companies that don't know how to be um, like media first, video, audio, content first, like a PR, almost like they are their own PR company. They are, they are their own media company. Those companies might need a PR agency. Um, but the companies that do get it, it sounds like you've been building out digital and being more of a media company. That's where you, you're like, it doesn't make sense to pay this money to this PR agency because we get it. We could do it ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are, you know, the company's in a situation where they don't know how to do that. You know, there's a few ways you could do that, right? So one is hire a PR firm or... If you add up that money you spend on PR, you can hire two people to come in and who know what they're doing and do it for you and kind of control your own destiny. Um, so I don't know. I mean, those are tough questions. Everybody's got to figure out, but um, I think they need to, you know, marketing leaders need to be kind of eyes open on how they're going to compare and contrast um, options there. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about narrative science and some mm -hmm. of the stuff that's working well for you in terms of marketing and channels. Like what's, what's going really well? What are you doubling down on? Well, so first of all, we talked about this, uh, challenging the status quo works well. Uh, we tested a lot of stuff here, uh, from, um, problem-based messaging to solution-based messaging to product-based messaging in kind of paid media. And the clear, the clear, clear winner uh, is uh, kind of problem-based messaging, or you know, the challenge people have versus the solution to that challenge versus your product. And I think for a lot of marketers, that's not surprising. But when this has been helpful, this this experimentation for when we talk to our product organization, our CEO, to be like, we've tested all this a variety of different ways. This is the winner, um, and so. That's obviously been very helpful for us. And so our challenge here is to keep iterating on that and keeping it fresh. Um, the community focus, we've ran four, um, four digital events since COVID. We've started a podcast. We've created uh, kind of the change, data change makers community. And this has all been well received and um, been galvanizing for us as a company and, and, and it's worked well. And I would say surprisingly, or maybe to some, the by and far, by and large, the best channel for us in paid media is Facebook and Instagram. Um, not even a comparison to like LinkedIn. And we're doing some testing now in search. Um, but my guess is the results on search for us will not be as good or near as good as the results we've seen on Facebook and Instagram. Why do you think you're getting such great success from Facebook and Instagram? Like, what are you, what are you actually doing on there that's, that you've tested and you've tweaked and you've found yeah. something? It's funny. Um, we've had a lot of this conversation with, uh, with our agency. And if I, even if I asked, and they've done a lot of good job, they've done really well on experimentation and, and testing. And we've done a lot of you know, we'll run 10 or 15 different small campaigns at a time and so forth and so on. And if I ask them, like, what do you think the biggest difference is? They'll say um, messaging and creative. So again, we've got a strong position that we take that we're unapologetic about that, that grabs people's attention. And then this person on my team who's never had a digital background, who spends half her time on digital, has worked very well with our head of demand, Jen, who's a brilliant copywriter, um, to build the combination of message and creativity into like whatever that is, uh, an ad image, a video, whatever, and, you know, interesting and fun ways. Um, and so it's interesting, like, this is not really the answer I would expect, but this is the answer I get from my team, it's the answer I get from the people who respond to our ads, like how often do you have people saying these ads are awesome to you on LinkedIn or on Facebook about an ad? And so it's been the time and energy and focus that the teams put into learning their craft on, you know, messaging and creative.
Yeah. You know, it honestly, sometimes it just comes down to like basics, right? Like, why is this working? What are we doing right? Um, and message, it is messaging and creative and it's going to be different by company, yep. but you just have to really know that very well. Um, and strong position doesn't hurt. Like the fact that you're challenging status quo, people know who the villain is. I'm sure that's helpful too. It, it does. And I think this to me is like the lesson for marketing teams is, you know, you have to have something to say that grabs people's attention, but you have to say it in a way that's creative and grabs their attention. And that, that should be the thing that your marketing team differentiates on. The, the ability to run that in Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you know, you know, paid search. Those are all things you would like your team to be able to do, but those are things that, you know, are easily to, are easier to get on the outside. And that's where our partner helps us out um, doing that for us. And it's a good relationship back and forth. Yeah, that that's great. Um, what about um, what about challenges? Like, what are you trying to figure out? What we've I guess you did mention that at the very beginning, right? Um, the psychographic, it's uh, finding these people that yeah. fit your ICP. So there's there's two real things. One is the, the psychographic bit. The other is we've built a product, an analytics product for business users. And that would lead us to believe, well, let's just target business users and not analytics teams. But analytics teams are the teams who tend to buy these tools and deploy these tools. So we purposely, I mean, we don't have a lot of, we built the experience and the capabilities in the product for the end user, not so much the analyst, but we need the analyst. And so it's this balancing act between not just marketing, targeting and positioning and going after these two groups, but also on the product strategy where our IP and differentiation is in the experience, but we also need to be able to have tools to enable the analysts, um, you know, to be the data storyteller using our tools. And so this yin and yang is something that, you know, we constantly need to balance in the market. Um, you know, if we go, solely after the analyst community, they will be interested and they will lean in, but you can go down a path of building things for them that don't create value for the end user. Going down the path of only the end user and disregarding the analysts, you'll get blocked by the analysts uh, when you go to deploy in bigger companies. So this is something that we're figuring out, like the right mix um, on both marketing and product. And we yeah. do that together, but it's a, it's kind of a narrow thread to, you know, we have to balance. That's yeah, absolutely true. Um, I'm kind of going off script here cause I'm actually curious. You mentioned some of the marketing activities that are working really well for you, including, uh, you know, paid media community focus with like your, the um, digital events and the podcast, which is more like long-term brand building. How do you think about um, measuring stuff like ROI? How do you measure? How do you make sure that marketing is tied to revenue? Like what, what are you doing to, because you, you, it sounds like you're able to try new things, right? Experiment a little bit. How do you make sure that you're able to, to do that and, and um, talk to finance and spend some money in the experimentation? We, um, it's a little bit easier for us because, uh, we uh, marketing's chartered with uh, driving the growth of the company. So we don't measure this in leads. We measure it in pipeline and revenue. Uh, you know, when I, when I started, I would say 60% of our revenue is marketing sourced already. Now it is 90 some percent marketing sourced. Um, and there's reasons for that we can get into, but um, so the luxury of the, the, the benefit of that is, um, we can look at spend versus impact, like spend versus return pretty, a lot easier than if you're, you have a more complex mix. We're spending this much in the team and in paid and like, how are we seeing that return? How's that flow through from lead to lead conversion of pipeline and pipeline to 
to revenue and looking at the source and looking at it by sales rep, like all that data, like that sits with me so I can see the whole thing and I can figure out the levers to pull and we're responsible for those levers. The downside is we're responsible for those levers. So what this creates a challenge in marketing is how to continue being fresh and creative if something is working. Um, and so that's, I wish I had a better solution for that other than we try to get as efficient as we can with, um, with what we're doing and the return on that to hit our targets in order to create flexibility for us to try new things. And so this is a constant discussion I have to have with my team because there's no shortage of ideas that they want to do. And um, it's, you know, we got to be really efficient in one area and that's going to be in where we can measure that. And that's going to afford us the ability to be creative in other areas that we want to experiment and try to kind of set us up for the future. But this is a weekly conversation. <laughs> so, um, and part of that's because I put, when I joined, I, that's the culture I created in the marketing team. We will drive growth of this company. And, um, you know, the pressure comes with that um, on the organization and the trade-offs. So, Yeah, but I like how you mentioned that you're really trying to make the process of like, okay, we're, we're doing really well with this channel, generating revenue, hitting our goals. How do we... How do we make that more efficient so we can spend more time on the creative stuff? So I love how you said that. And you you don't you don't focus on leads. It sounds like you focus on the pipeline and the revenue from a marketing perspective. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, we focus on pipeline and revenue. We obviously look at leads because that's a leading indicator. But we've also gotten down to like, you know, we have definitions of good leads, and so like we've we've been able to look at like what leads are going to be the best predictor of what becomes pipeline. And because, and we're only looking at leads, by the way, in this context who raise their hand. So one of the other things we've done is we don't pass leads to sales if they're not demo requests. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, so we get demo requests in, and even within that re demo request, while we'll pass and follow up with all of them, we um, have a subset that we use for targeting when it comes to spend. And that is a, you know, we call that the definition of a good lead or a desired lead, meaning we know this is our sweet spot. Then we look at paid efficiency on that sweet spot versus paid efficiency on total number of requests and demos. And that helps us figure out like how targeted we can get with our paid media spend. And that definition is predicated on what we know converts the fastest through the sales cycle. Very smart method. I love it. 90% um, marketing sourced. The revenue is 90% marketing sourced now. Um, can you talk through like what changes had to be put in place to get there? Well, you know, we've, just not had success outbound. So we've had SDRs and we've prospected and we have senior, we have some senior salespeople who know what they're doing and, we do, and we've tried it and we just haven't seen a consistent, repeatable success given the time and effort to go into that. And so um, it was one, it was acknowledging that across marketing and sales. And two, it was also the understanding that um, we could create more demand with more spend on the marketing side more official, more efficiently. And so also, obviously, we had to spend more there to be able to do that. And so that was kind of a tacit agreement we had with leadership and across marketing and sales. Now, our sales team will, doesn't mean they don't prospect, like they just, don't have to, like they will do it, but they're gonna do it by senior accounts, top down, um, very personalized, um, where their experience and knowledge can pay off because um, they've been selling in this space for many years. And so 
we don't count any of that when it comes to like targeting. We just look at that as upside if if it happens. Um, and one of the ways we help them do that is by um, while we'll pass only requested demos to their queues, we also give visibility into everybody who's engaged with us. So we, what I tell them is I'd like you to, if you're going to prospect, start with people in our database who's, who've engaged and know who we are, which is very logical. Um, and, you know, reach out to them first versus going cold. Um, and that's how we, you know, building a community and, and capturing leads and, you know, other contacts in a variety of different ways is important um, because we can measure who's engaging with us and who's interested. And we don't expect sales to follow up, but that information is there for them if they want to. I love this because this is, this is different. This is um, the, the, the fact that you're driving 90% of um, revenue, it, it's marketing sourced, right? And that your sales team doesn't have to prospect. And here's what they can spend their time on. They go to the senior accounts, they go, to, they go to, you know, top down, they, they get more personalized and they spend their time there. It sounds like they're more senior people. They know, they know what yes. they're doing. Yep. This is a different approach yep. than um, a ton of other startups out there. So I just want to bring this to the light. And especially as we're heading into this, this more digital, right? Like the buyer decides when they want to talk to sales. Um, so make sure that you're doing everything that you should be doing from a marketing standpoint to like give them the stuff they are looking for as they need it. And then put your sales team on, you know, the work that's actually b better time spent, I would yeah, say. The, you know, so I'll give one an example um, where this, I think, works really well. We know uh, we work best coming top down, which is unusual for an analytics product, by the way. But the bigger, com the, bigger the company you're in, the harder it is to reach them top down on the channels that work well for us. Um, so one of our sales reps, you know, he he prospected the CEO of one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world. We're talking 70, 80, 90 billion dollar company and got a response and we got a meeting. Now that meeting today doesn't turn into anything, but that is a relationship that came top down that we would never be able to get through Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn ads, right? Or pretty hard to get the CEO of a company that big on my podcast uh, today anyway. So that is time well spent. Um, and that's what you want senior sales leaders doing, not mass prospecting mid-market companies um, where the return is just not there and I can reach them easier and I'm, broader scale cheap or cheaply through marketing channels. There's so many benefits that I, I, I can see on the sales side. And that also includes like, you don't need a huge sales team. It's a lot of the time you're like, oh my gosh, we're growing. We got funding. Let's pull on that lever and bring in the SDRs and we need to double them. We need to double the, you know, it's always like in my experience that those are the conversations that are happening um, totally. versus, you know, the marketing team needs to double, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so it's re very refreshing to hear you talk about this and how you're 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 handling this within your company. So yeah, I appreciate thanks. that. Thanks um, for sharing. The one thing I'll say on the sales side, and this is somewhat unique in our company, is I'm also the de facto kind of sales revenue operations person. So I'm I'm working with the sales team uh, day in and day out. So. I've, we've modeled sales capacity. So part of our marketing strategy is, yes, we want to drive leads and revenue, but the other is we understand what the capacity level of the sales team is. And so what I look at is like, are we keeping the sales team at capacity? If they're the bottom, if they're the, the constrained resource of the Herbie, if you ever read the goal, um, we want to make sure that constrained resource is at capacity because that's the thing that's going to drive our revenue engine. And so, this has been helpful to the marketing team to be, yes, there's a level of efficiency, but if, we're, if we have an expensive resource idle, 
we need to spend here in order to drive, um, you know, capacity up. And if we do that well, this is what the conversion rates are going to look like. Yeah, makes sense. I like that approach. Um, let's talk about, let's go back to marketing. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about sales too much. Let's go back to marketing. <laughs> um, what would you, what, what are like a couple of really good marketing ideas that you've come up with that, that you've worked on? Um, could be recent, doesn't have to be recent though. So I don't come up with good ideas. Uh, my team comes up with good ideas. So all my good ideas are, um, my experience affords me the ability to put the right people into the right role, find the right vendors to come in and augment where we don't have skills and, um, make tactical decisions. Like I, I push through the, um, the bringing on of gong, which has been wildfire in our company. And, um, so things like that, those are the types of decisions I make that turn out good. My team, they're the ones that have made the decisions on a lot of the stuff we've talked about from pivoting to virtual events, to the podcast, to, um, coming up with the messaging and the creative around challenging the status quo to the woman who runs growth for me, um, pushed our company to a massive pivot on our go to market strategy for our latest product about nine months ago. And she's the one that literally drove the company to make this change. And since that's change, we're kind of off to the races. There's a fundamental decision point in our company to make this pivot driven by her. Um, so my job is to get the people in the right place, get them the, the resources they need to do their job and kind of get out of the way and let them um, be the ones that come up with all the creative ideas. And everything we've talked to up to this point has been, um, you know, really driven through the team. And all, you, know, well, so. you sound like a great leader. The, the folks that I bring on the show and they're like, well, I have all these ideas. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that everybody, it's great like hearing that, but but people do say like, it's not me, it's my team. They bring the good ideas and that's 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 great too. It, it works just as well. Um, and my team is good at, this is what experience affords um, uh, a talented young team is they'll come to me and be like, listen, I know you've done this. Can you just walk me through like how I should think about it? And that's easy for me to do. Like strategically you should think about it this way and break it down like this when it comes to the ideas and kind of what we run with i want them to be the ones kind of making those decisions and learning from it mm -hmm. that's why you're hiring these people that are sort of like set a high bar still exactly. learning stuff curious it, it all makes sense it's coming together um Excellent. what what would you say are some of like the worst rec recommendations in in marketing that you've heard <laughs> What did I put that? What did I, yeah. Um, I don't have. Uh, we've allowed. This is what I hear uh, a little too much on on LinkedIn. We've we've allowed marketers to have. We've created a culture in the marketing discipline of having a lot of excuses. So the CEO doesn't get marketing. My sales team will, is unreasonable, won't work with me. Um, I need to have a fantastic product that everybody loves in order to be a good marketer. The conversation of brand versus performance, I think is incorrect, but I don't have a better suggestion yet, but I'm working on it. What do you mean brand versus performance? Like which one is more important or what's the point just, of each? Yeah, I think it's um I think it's not the right comparison. Um and and what it does is it creates kind of these artificial discussions about um needing to make trade-offs. And I feel like a lot of that's predicated on vendors trying to sell stuff or agencies trying to pitch their services or what, what have you. And so, yeah, I think it's tough. Marketers are hit with a bunch of shit out there that doesn't make any sense. 
and they're being told it's not them, it's other people. Um, and you don't really see that as much from any other function in an organization. And so what I, my message to marketers is like, you shouldn't be, you got to get past being defensive and you need to be on the offensive and you need to understand your role in driving success in your business, whether it's big or small, be proud of that and be good at it. And, you know, stop bitching and moaning. Um, <laughs> this is a video clip for sure. <laughs> All the swears. I love this one, but you've got a great point. And, you know, sometimes you are in companies and I've been there. I've failed. Uh, That's why I can say these things and I've learned from those things. And sometimes you're in a company where you've done everything you can and the role or you are appreciated and you only have one option and that is to leave. And you should just do that because, you know, life's too short to be in a miserable situation when good marketers are in high demand. So that's my message. I love this message. And I, yeah, there are a lot of excuses on LinkedIn um, and we should not allow for that. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to make an up, make up an excuse and it's like, not you, it's somebody else, but yeah. it's much more meaningful. I think that um, when you look at what is it that you can do differently next time? Thank you, Cassidy, so much. This has been such a great, meaningful, um, eye-opening conversation. And I learned a lot from you. And I really enjoyed not just the marketing part of the conversation, but the sales part as well. I think that a lot of learnings came out of it. So thank you. Cassidy is on LinkedIn. Cassidy Shield, if anybody wants to find him. And then to find out more about narrative science, you can go to narrativescience.com. Thank you, Cassidy. Thanks, Anne. I really enjoyed it.